Hello, welcome everybody. We see many of you coming in. Just give a couple of seconds. Great to see everybody and such interest in this session today. So thank you and welcome to this online launch of SEI's new knowledge event series from words to action, implementing biodiversity and climate strategies for resilient societies. Today's webinar is the first of six interconnected events held by SEI's global centers during autumn 2024. They are set to elevate scientific findings on climate and nature and to present key tools for locally relevant action. But before we move forward, I've got a few housekeeping items to mention. We have a Q&A tool to capture questions. So please do post your questions in there. Uh, and we also aim to have some time at the end of the event for a Q&A with our SEI experts. So please continue to submit questions during the event and we can filter them to the right person. The event team will also share links in the chat, but the chat isn't going to be open to everyone so that we can stay focused on the content of the presentations. So thank you very much. And as all of you on this call are very aware or very interested in, climate change, biodiversity loss and pollution have become more urgent, severe, and are unpredictably escalating. Policymakers are trying to tackle those issues alongside the persistent problems of social inequity and inequality, whilst at the same time competition for land and other critical resources increases. And to deal with these different challenges, there are many and varied tools that are needed, and many are available. Um, however, integrated efforts to address these challenges are not yet manifesting sufficiently in practice at the scale that is required. And this is despite what is known about the interconnectivity of the Earth system, and again, the interconnectivity with human societies, that many policies and actions still treat nature and climate in isolation. I want to just raise a, an additional point today, just to go off script a bit and talk about the unprecedented drought and wildfires that are occurring in the Amazon right now. Um, satellite data from Brazil's Space Research Agency has registered about 340,000 fire hotspots so far this year in all the 13 countries of South America, and that surpasses the record that was set in 2007. Um, you can read some coverage um, in Reuters about this, where several scientists have been interviewed about what's happening there. There's also some great information on the World Weather Attribution um, website. But a clear message that's coming from scientists is of the cascading effects of climate change. And in this instance, combined with deforestation, driving droughts, which undermines the resilience of one of the wettest regions in the world. And personally, you know, my this is my words, this is unspeakable impacts on species, indigenous groups, ranchers, farmers, fishermen, economies, plus the vast carbon store that is in the Amazon. And our SEI colleague, Monica Trillo, will discuss this problem of deforestation and intense ecological degradation in the Amazon in her speed talk later on. But I wanted to bring this point up at the opening of our session, as this is something that is happening right now. There's a phrase that the UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, used um, at the press conference for the IPCC's most recent synthesis report. He stated that everything, everywhere, all at once, uh, was required. And with that quote, he was underscoring how joined up prolific action by every country and every sector and on every time frame was needed to meet this deeply intractable challenge of climate change. This event series is humbly seeking to contribute to the UN Secretary General's call. Um, Alessia, could we have the next slide, please? And by amplifying global scientific level insights on the interconnectivity of our climate and the natural world, but also to connect it to tangible knowledge approaches for use in diverse regions. Today, we're truly honored to welcome the chairs of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, Professor Jim Ski, and International Panel for Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, IPES, Dr. David Abura. And they will both remind us of the key scientific messages on climate and biodiversity from their respective intergovernmental assessments. We have the next slide, please. 
Following on from them is a range of fantastic SEI scientists who will preview the upcoming events in this broader series, which are set to explore science-based response strategies in Latin America, in Africa, in the US, in Eastern Europe, and in Asia. But before all of this, I would like to introduce a warm welcome to SEI's Re Research Director and Deputy Director, Professor Orsa Pachon, a social scientist and expert on climate and sustainable development governance, who's going to contextualize SEI's work on these topics for us. Orsa heads the SEI Department of Global Research, and she also leads the work of the SEI Global Research Committee, of which all of the centers presenting today are a part of. Orsa, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maya, for that introduction and for organizing this whole event series. Uh, we hope that many of you listening in will participate in the regional dialogues to follow. Uh, I know we are all eagerly awaiting to listen to our distinguished speakers today, um, Jim and David, but let me first extend a personal welcome to them. To start with, IPCC. SCI is very proud to share some history and origin uh, with this institution. We were both founded in the late 1980s on the back of the Brundtland Report, building on the idea that science is not only needed instrumentally to inform and underpin policy, but coming together in an assessment and a joint sense-making process also has significant value in and of itself for legitimacy, um, for creating that shared understanding, shared evidence base. When IPES was founded two decades later at SCI, we saw equal value in uh, engaging with IPES, and we continue to this day to provide scientific publications to fit into the assessments, uh, engaging researchers to contribute as author reviewers, using the report in our very applied research and engagement uh, with policymakers at all levels around the world, and also trying to support in communicating and amplifying the key messages from the reports. So as we now head into new assessment cycles, uh, as well as critical COP meetings lined up this fall uh, to really accelerate implementation, uh, whether it's through the nationally determined contributions, the NDCs, or the national biodiversity strategies and action plans, uh, our ambition at SEI with these convenings that we're kicking off today uh, are twofold. First, to amplify world-class scientific insights on climate and biodiversity and their interconnectivity, as Maya uh, outlined with that very compelling example from the Amazon. The impacts, the solutions, recognizing both the positive synergies and co but also being honest realistic and um, specific about the goal conflicts that we sometimes are faced with, at least in the short term. And second, to present tried and tested tools and approaches from SEI for locally relevant joint action. So I'm really looking forward to listen to the researchers at the end of this uh, webinar. Having studied the practice of policy integration myself in my earlier career, to say that silos and disconnects is much less common at the level of practice often. If you speak to practitioners, uh, let's say a farmer, a small business owner, it often comes very natural to them to think about uh, multiple goals together, uh, reducing emissions, adapting to climate change, protecting nature, as well as, of course, ensuring economic and social sustainability. They simply cannot afford to have silos or very narrow approaches, but need to be smart and cost-effective in their actions. At the policy level, however, it is more common to still have siloed planning for climate and nature. And so far, nature protection is associated with less political will, less investment. Some of the most acute goal conflicts we see today um, when advancing the climate transition for example, building out renewables and securing space for solar panels, wind turbines, while at the same time ensuring that landscape integrity, ecosystem connectivity and biodiversity. And this is not even bringing in land rights as an issue into the equation and the challenge of many smallholders and indigenous people to uphold land rights. 
At the same time, there are, as you will hear from my colleagues, uh, major untapped potential for integrated and synergistic solutions, such as expanding the bioeconomy or using nature-based uh, solutions wisely. So moving back to the IPCC and IPES, uh, in 2020, they co-sponsored a workshop to explore the links between climate and biodiversity, a significant effort and a landmark in their histories. And the resulting outcome report is an excellent digest uh, outlining current trends, the role and implementation of nature-based solutions and sustainable development of human society. So I recommend anyone who has not read this report to do so. You can access it uh, through the link in the chat, and to, to uh, quote it. It is the nature of complex systems that they have unexpected outcomes and thresholds, but also that the individual parts cannot be managed in isolation from one another. Only by considering climate and biodiversity as part of the same complex problem, which also includes the actions and motivations and aspirations of people, can solutions be developed that avoid maladaptation and maximize the beneficial outcome? And on that note, uh, I welcome to the floor the first of our two uh, keynote speakers today, uh, Professor Jim Ski, um, Chair of IPC. A very warm welcome, and the floor is yours. Okay, uh, th thank you very much, Asa. And uh, can I just thank SEI for this opportunity to participate uh, in this in this session, and also to continue the conversation with David Abura. We've had many conversations about links between IPBES and IPCC, and it's very useful to continue this. So, in setting up this session, I was given three homework questions. One was about uh, the key messages on climate and biodiversity from the IPCC sixth assessment. A second question, a huge one, how can countries and actors meet the Paris Agreement goals? And the third one, how can the climate and biodiversity communities collaborate? And I'll do my best to address these three questions. Now, so starting off on climate, nature, biodiversity, why is IPCC interested? Almost the very first sentence of the sixth cycle assess synthesis report was a recognition of the interdependence of climate, ecosystems and biodiversity and human societies and the close linkages between climate change adaptation, mitigation, ecosystem health, human well-being and sustainable development. So let me try and just highlight three broad ways in which IPCC has assessments have interacted with nature and biodiversity. First, and it's perhaps the most obvious one, the direct impacts of climate change on natural systems. And in the sixth cycle, this was addressed in the Working Group 2 report on impacts, adaptation and vulnerability, in the special report on climate change in land, and in the special report on oceans and cryosphere in a changing climate. To provide an example, the very first sentence of the special report on land, land provides the principal basis for human livelihoods and well-being, including the supply of food, fresh water and multiple other ecosystem services, as well as biodiversity. And it goes on. Climate change creates additional stresses on land, exacerbating existing risks to livelihoods, biodiversity, human and ecosystem health, infrastructure, and food systems. And it goes on to note that increasing impacts on land are projected under all future greenhouse gas emission scenarios. As mentioned earlier, the adverse impacts from climate hazards and resulting risks are cascading across sectors and regions and propagating impacts. And these hazards and cascading risks also trigger tipping points in sensitive ecosystems. Wildfires already mentioned have affected ecosystems and species, people, their built assets and economic activity. And in the Amazonian region and in some mountain regions, cascading impacts from climate and non-climatic stressors are resulting in irreversible and severe losses of ecosystem services and biodiversity at two degrees global warming and beyond. The likelihood and impacts of abrupt or irreversible changes in the climate system, including changes triggered when tipping points are reached, increase with further global warming. 
and as global warming increases, so do the risks of species extinction or irreversible loss of biodiversity in ecosystems, including forests, coral reefs, and in the Arctic regions. So the nexus is extremely clear. And note that it's not just about land, which I've mentioned uh, uh, so far. Uh, David, uh, I think you will see when you see his screen background, will remind us that oceans and marine systems are also suffering huge risks. A second theme in IPCC reports has been that natural systems, so-called nat nat and the nature-based solutions, can contribute to climate change mitigation and adaptation. The special report on land identified many specific actions that can contribute to climate change adaptation with mitigation co-benefits, as well as to halting biodiversity loss with sustainable development co-benefits to society. And these cover specifically agriculture, forests, soils, and fire management. The land report also brought in the demand side, which included novelly for IPCC, the issues of dietary change and addressing food loss and waste. But a very strong message from our scientists was that nature and land can't do it all. Rapid and immediate reductions in emissions from fossil fuels are also essential. And the third one that I want to flag, flag up is that an anxiety that arose from the fifth assessment cycle and the special report on 1.5 degrees warming, that the large scale adoption of mitigation approaches with implications for land use, including bioenergy with or without CCS, biochar, et cetera, could have significant negative impacts on biodiversity. And I would note food security. So these reports and perhaps that emphasised generated much criticism in the literature and has been addressed, I think, at least partly in the special reports on land and in the uh, sixth assessment cycle reports. Now, the second homework question was how can countries and actors meet the Paris Agreement goals? And I have to say my reaction to that is where to start. It's such a good, a big, big question. But let's just take the three overall goals of the Paris Agreement. And first of all, the long-term temperature goal. And frankly, we are way off course. With every year of inaction, 1.5 limiting warming to 1.5 degrees is slipping away. And overshoot and return would have huge implications, not least for land use and biodiversity. Emissions and the use of fossil fuels is continuing to rise. And current policies will lead to what I will unscientifically describe as three-ish degrees of warming this century. We have had some successes on the energy supply side, notably on renewable energy, in particular wind and solar, which has expanded. But note that the growth has been focused on Europe, North America and China. Development in Africa and low income countries is being held back by the high cost of capital and lack of investment in grid infrastructure that will allow renewables to be absorbed. And an even bigger challenge is that energy supply and technical fixes are not going to be enough. They're the easy bit. A corporate board can make big decisions on, for example, an offshore wind project with huge impacts on emissions. But we need to move to the demand side. Think about efficiency, changes in consumption patterns. And this is going to involve engaging millions, if not billions, of citizens in smaller scale actions. So the challenge is social as well as technical. It also involves paying more attention to land-based actions, where again, millions, if not billions of landholders need to be engaged. And as well as economic and social challenges there, there are considerable difficulties in reliably accounting for the emission impacts of actions. Second Paris goal on vulnerability and adaptation. The good news is that adaptation planning and implementation has progressed against all sectors and regions. And we've been able to document benefits, though with varying effectiveness. However, most of the observed adaptation responses have been fragmented, incremental, sector specific and unequally distributed across regions. Uh, and the, the ga adaptation gaps will continue to grow under current levels of implementation, with the biggest adaptation gaps among lower income groups. We've reached hard and soft limits to adaptation in some ecosystems and regions. 
some tropical, coastal, polar and mountain ecosystems have actually reached hard adaptation limits. And soft limits to adaptation, institutional limits, are currently being experienced by small scale farmers and households along some low lying coastal areas. And these result from financial, governance, institutional and policy constraints. And the final goal of Paris on means of implementation, principally finance issues. Both adaptation and mitigation financing would need to increase many fold to reach the Paris goals. The gaps are much larger for adaptation than they are for mitigation, and they're also less amenable to quantification. The mitigation gaps for financing are lowest for energy supply, notably renewables, but largest for land-based interventions, which tend to be smaller in scale. There is sufficient money in the world to close the global investment gaps, but there are barriers to redirecting capital to climate action. Uh, so there are a number of options for scaling up mitigation in developing countries, including increased levels of public finance, increased use of public guarantees to reduce risks, and building up local capital markets. Now, the final uh, question I was given, I'm keeping a careful eye on the time, was the question of collaboration between uh, climate and biodiversity scientific communities. So I just want to pose the question is actually, I'm going to look at it from the point of view of the UN environmental assessments. A question, who actually owns these assessments? Is it governments? Is it the host institutions like UNEP or WMO? Or is it the scientists who actually write the report? And my answer to that is everybody and nobody. Without any of these groups, collaboration would come to nothing. And that is a miracle that these groups are being pulled together under the UN assessments. But that raises the question, how do we collaborate and at what level? And the key for me is scientific collaboration, because if we look at the institutional side, we see frequently get trapped in discussions about mandates, methods of working, compatibility with procedures. The question, can we produce joint reports? And David and I have actually dis discussed this, and I have agreed, and I hope we still agree, that the priority is to focus on scientific collaboration within existing mandates, acknowledging each other's activities, for example, the IPCC land report, the best nexus assessment, joint workshops, which are perfectly possible, consulting each other during scoping processes. And since we draw on shared scientific communities, especially from IPCC's point of view, natural systems in the IPCC working group to impacts and adaptation world, how we select authors uh, and how we select people to come to scoping meetings. We can review each other's drafts and we can learn from best practice. And I think it best does a better job on indigenous knowledge. For example, IPCC has put a lot of work on glossaries. So very practical ways in which we can complement and enhance each other's efforts without changing any of the fundamental structures of our systems. Now, before I finish, just a word on the institutional side from an IPCC perspective. The knowledge systems and policy systems to which IPCC is connected to are enormously diverse. There are significant cultural differences between IPCC's working groups and the disciplines on which they draw. And they're an equally diverse group of policymakers that attend IPCC meetings. Sure, we have environment ministries and agencies, but we also have focal points from foreign affairs ministries, energy and industry ministries. For environment ministries, it's often the case that the focal points for IPCC and IPBES may be the same person. And it's these people that tend to be most enthusiastic about IPBES IPCC collaboration, with enthusiasm tending to be less if focal points come from foreign affairs or energy industry ministries. It's also the case that countries with strong institutional capacities may be less enthusiastic about synthesis and integration. They think they can do that themselves, thank you very much. It's countries with the weaker capacities that may see more value in joining up. So just to end, I personally am very supportive of addressing the linked planetary crisis of climate, biodiversity, and also pollution, for which a new panel, uh, I think, is under development. I made this one of the themes of uh, when I was uh, campaigning to be IPCC chair. 
But what I would like to see is the effort that the contributors put in where it's most effective. And I personally think that lies on practical collaboration at the scientific level. And with that, I will finish. And I think I'm more or less on time now. You are absolutely on time. Thank you so much, Professor Ski, for that, for reminding us both of the concrete scientific evidence, but also touching on these incredibly important questions of scientific collaboration, implementation of that knowledge, and notably finance, which are also key questions, both at the CBD COP16 and, and Climate COP29 later this year. So with that, I would happily, gladly welcome Dr. David Abura to the floor to complement our understanding um, with his presentation, Nature and Climate, an IPES Perspective. David, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maya. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here and honoured to be speaking uh, at this event, kicking off uh, the seminar series for the Stockholm Environment Institute. Uh, very glad to speak with with Jim Ski, uh, my counterpart and the chair of the IPCC. And as Jim has mentioned, um, we have had several conversations We and we share a real um, common vision in how our sciences really need to complement one another and work together because, because of the one planet that we're dealing with. Um, I do have some slides, so if I can um, have the first slide up, please. So like Jim, I was given three homework questions to address. And the first one I'll address with some slides and then and then go to the, the second and the third, which were very complementary to Jim's as well. Uh, so the first one really looking at uh, nature and climate, for, but from an IPBES perspective. Um, and what I'd like to do is to highlight, of course, our signature assessment, uh, the, the global assessment, which came out uh, in 2019. Uh, and the cover is down there. And this really um, established and really locked in the, the framework uh, that IPBES is using to address the various uh, interactions between uh, nature and people, uh, economy and society. Uh, and I'll go into that a little bit more. This is a classic uh, image from the summary for policymakers of that assessment showing the interactions from indirect drivers on the left, uh, so demographic, sociocultural, economic, and technological institutions and conflicts, uh, which influence direct drivers. And we identify five direct drivers of biodiversity decline, uh, of which climate change is one of those. Um, and in 2019, um, the assessment authors uh, rated that climate change was, I think, the third in line behind land and sea use change and direct exploitation of nature in terms of driving impacts on natural systems. Of course, that is shifting uh, as we move forward. We're now five years on uh, from the date of that global assessment, and we'll have a second global assessment has been approved by our plenary. Uh, we'll come out now in, in four years' time. So we're looking forward to how that is reassessed. The joint workshop report uh, that IPBES and IPCC did together, the workshop was in 2020, and the report came out in 2021, was uh, mentioned by, by us at the beginning very sort of grateful for that because I think this really was a, a landmark report for both institutions in looking at the integration between nature and climate and how important that is uh, because it's not a report that was mandated by our plenaries um, and was a, was a workshop rather than assessment. It doesn't hold the same uh, status in terms of the findings, but of course the science uh, comes from the same scientific communities and gets incorporated into the, into the full assessments. Um, following that. If I can have the next slide. What I try to do here is really because uh, nature is um, very immediate to people. We all live in nature. We're a part of nature. And there's an ongoing discussions about this. Um, and so it makes it very complicated uh, to deal with uh, and to address. It best developed a conceptual framework over a number of years. Uh, and that box in the middle there is the conceptual framework showing nature as the primary box on the bottom how nature supplies contributions to people. This is a more general term for ecosystem services because um, there are many different types of contributions which are outlined in the in the panel on the left. You can't see them in this slide, but there are 18 of them um, that have been identified, such as food and feed, pollination, carbon sequestration, and so on. And then these contributions people provide for good quality of life. And there are multiple boxes there about indirect drivers and institutions, the direct drivers. 
Now, the structure is a bit um, inaccessible to many people. And one of the things that I uh, see as my charge to do is, as a chair coming from the science side is to try and really communicate more effectively or to communicate in a way that is very that speaks to people's experience on the ground, as mentioned by Orsa. People tend to be very practical and integrated in their daily lives. So I can have one click. I do have a, some transitions here. So you can translate our conceptual framework into the standard sustainable development framework. So nature provides uh, for direct uses and contributions to economic activities. These economic activities provide benefits to society and support our welfare. But then society affects how we run our economies through indirect drivers and institutions and so on. And these economic activities are the direct drivers of what happens to nature and in the current context of decline because of because of excessive uses and damaging uses. And in the context of our discussion here between nature and climate change, uh, for the IPBES conceptual framework, climate change is one of the one of the five direct drivers, as I mentioned on the uh, on the previous slide. Now, the important thing here is that climate change doesn't come from nowhere. It's not just a physical process uh, that, that comes from, from nature. It comes from our economic activities, and in particular, the way we promulgate our economies through the indirect drivers uh, of growth uh, and you know, consumption uh, and financial systems and the incentives that they drive. So understanding these is a central part of what IPBES offers in terms of understanding biodiversity and ecosystem services. So if I can go to the next slide. Now I provide a quick slide. Uh, I, I told Jim I have one of his slides here. This of course is from the IPCC AR6 report showing the projections uh, for, for climate change into the, into the future and the burning embers diagrams that we know so well. And the first one there, unique and threatened ecosystems or systems, this is nature. This is the systems that we live in and that support people. Um, I worked on coral reefs as a as a biodiversity scientist, and coral reefs are right at the beginning of uh, of this uh, rising climate and the first e one of the first ecosystems showing climate impacts. If we can click again, as alluded to by Jim in his talk, we are very close to that one and a half degree uh, threshold um, target or barrier that we uh, aspired not to cross, but it's. You know, it's it's highly unlikely that we won't cross that at this point. Uh, but even the current commitments uh, are taking us into quite a warm world, and the current practices to an even warmer world than that. So, I think the key message that um, we want to bring from the sciences is to really show to decision makers the urgency and and the real need for considering the evidence in the policies that that are being made, and to strengthen. That implementation as rapidly as possible, uh, because we are we are in a critical decade at this point in time. So next slide, please. In relation to the degree of climate change that we're facing now, I just want to highlight one or two key things in relation to biodiversity, because there are many, and I'm sure the uh, the regional presentations we'll have later on will highlight the how diverse uh, these issues are in different parts of the world. I want to highlight climate velocity trajectories. This is from the IPCC and IPAS workshop report that we produced together. And what these show is how far climate envelopes will move uh, with projected climate change. Now, this map on the left, that dark blue around the equator showing for the oceans, because um, that's my background, that dark blue region is where species are moving out from around the equator towards the poles. Um, and when you look at how far those, those um, climatic envelopes move, we assessed how this would be on continents, on islands, and in the ocean. That graph in the middle shows that in continents in green, what we assessed there was, is with one or two or six degrees of warming after 2020. So the base data here is from 2020, not from pre-industrial. But how far will a climatic envelope move for key biodiversity areas? These are the most important regions for biodiversity uh, on the planet. So on continents, we found that less than 10% will stay within the boundaries of a key biodiversity area as defined right now. Uh, close on um, you know, 80 to 85% will shift, but stay on land. And then in red at the top there are those that will be lost completely because the Climate envelope perhaps moves across a coastline uh, and and you know onto a uh, a place where it can't exist anymore. 
Of course, islands are much more vulnerable. You see the proportion of red is much higher on the top. And then one of the surprises was that for the ocean, which we think of as being larger and less uh, vulnerable to changes, you can see that the amount of red is over 50%, even with one degree of warming from 2020 baselines. So it's really important to understand what's happening and how far uh, natural systems, ecosystems will shift. And this is very important for the people that depend on them. And on the right, uh, just highlighting a horizon issue from a subsequent uh, analysis that considered this information is an issue that is not, as a scientist from tropical countries that I'm particularly concerned about, is this poleward movement of species. Um, while that means um, tropicalization of nature and of natural systems in high latitudes or in mid latitudes, at the equator, there are no species moving because moving in because there's no warmer places for them to come from. Uh, at the same time, these tropical areas are uh, experiencing larger climatic stresses in terms of uh, heat stress in the sea, acidification, deoxygenation as well, but also pollution and exploitation on land uh, from very rapidly growing populations and economic growth. So this, this could become a crisis. Um, will become a crisis in the future, not just for natural systems that we tend to think about for biodiversity, but for the farming systems that I think many of the regional presentations will focus on as well, the farming and fishing systems where people uh, run their livelihoods. So the next slide, please. This is a slide on joint nature and climate actions, another, another illustration from the workshop report. And this one is a very important one because we understand that nature offers solutions uh, which can be effective for both uh, biodiversity decline and emission reductions and adaptation from climate change. But the efficacy of those uh, solutions declines with increase in climate change. The other thing that's important here, and this is very active discussions around uh, nature-based solutions or ecosystem-based solutions, is that many climate actions are uh, to for adaptation of fit for mitigation can have quite negative impacts on biodiversity. Many are positive, but many can have negative impacts. And re we really need to understand and avoid those to not add stresses to biodiversity and particularly not to uh, to compromise people dependent on, on that nature. On the other hand, biodiversity actions at the bottom tend to have much more positive actions for climate as well, except in the, in the case of energy systems for climate, there, there, are some, there are some trade offs there that really need to be thought through. So we really need to have effective conservation and climate and social actions that go hand in hand uh, and to plan these very well uh, together. I can go to the next slide. And a big uh, part of the solution for these um, that the joint report also highlighted and comes into many of our subsequent assessments as well is the importance of landscape and seascape approaches. Uh, the notion that it's not just about um, so it best is about biodiversity and ecosystem services. It's not just about biodiversity where it's intact uh, and with very few human impacts and not many people um, using it and therefore not stressing it. It's also about those places where people are highly dependent on nature um, and for their agriculture and for their livelihoods uh, and for their local economies. Um, these are also places that tend to produce uh, foods uh, and products that are shipped for exports and that support national economies as well. And so supporting uh, these in an integrated way uh, is incredibly important. Um, so we would like to, I mean, many of the, the findings from IPES assessments, particularly looking towards the Nexus assessments uh, coming up, which we will submit for approval in December at our upcoming plenary, We'll really look at integrated and high quality ecosystem based approaches slash nature based solutions that assure biodiversity benefits and benefits from contributions to people um, and that these are, are well planned, the benefits go to um, are equitably shared uh, to 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 the right people and so on. I think it's very important here to think about how we value nature, the values assessment that we put out pointed out that. Um, Assuring we're looking at multiple values systems, so different types of worldviews from different cultures, uh, considering multiple worldviews, but also ensuring we're addressing the multiple values from nature, some of them being instrumental, some of them being um, 
uh, intrinsic and the relational ones that cultures and people depend on for psychological welfare and well-being as well uh, must be considered in moving forward. So that's part of the the second um, the second question that that we were given to deal with in terms of how can we look at local context and equity uh, to support sustainable economy and adaptation across scales and thinking about uh, climate vulnerability as well and and future prospects for uh, for development. Here, I think a critical aspect um, that it best is focused around uh, with our conceptual framework. Uh, is thinking about, so the Convention on Biological Diversity, of course, is one of the main environmental conventions that, that we respond to, that we provide information for. It's second and third objectives on sustainable use and equitable sharing of benefits. Those are also goals B and C of the Global Biodiversity Framework um, are critical to consider in the context of climate change and then planning for adaptation and the shifting baselines. Uh, all of these landscapes where you look at a, at a fixed space the climate will shift over it um, and the types of uh, the types of natural communities, the types of production uh, ecosystems that can persist in those places will shift over time. And we need to consider how that may happen and to plan and prepare for that. Lastly, um, I'll mention the invasive alien species assessments, uh, because, of course, the shifting climate has a lot of interactions uh, with invasive species and can often give them advantages in terms of because they're quite opportunistic and can move with climates perhaps uh, over native species. And then lastly, coming to the importance of transformative change. Uh, how do we galvanize transformations to global sustainability goals? Uh, our values assessment that I mentioned just now came out in 2022, and we have a transformative change assessment, uh, which is also coming for approval in December this year, um, really address um, how to try and deal with these uh, interwoven challenges uh, and solutions that we need to address for biodiversity, but also the governance and, and societal responses to, to make these solutions happen in, in an equitable way. And I think I'll finish with that then. Thank you so much, David, for highlighting so much from the IPES IPCC co-sponsored workshop on biodiversity and climate change, but also so clearly demonstrating why treating climate biodiversity and human societies as coupled systems are so key, um, including you know the, the multiple worldview and the multiple concept contexts of nature being critical to, to those types of responses. I will now hand over to two of my colleagues, uh, research fellow Karina Barquette and senior researcher Jonathan Green to reflect on these two presentations and provide a, an intervention exploring some of these aspects in more detail. So Karina and Jonathan, please, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Maya. In a time of multiple environmental crisis, it is great to hear from both the IPCC and IPES with the climate and biodiversity lenses respectively of shared agendas and benefits. And this is particularly timely as we head towards the three major conferences of the parties where countries are tasked with showing their commitment to climate finance, providing ambitions, updated nationally determined contributions for meeting the Paris Agreement, and to provide an update of the state of the implementation and alignment of their national biodiversity strategies and action plans with the global biodiversity framework. These are long names and a vast amount of work, but certainly needed. The climate system underpins the potential for all societies across the globe, as our speakers highlighted already. By connecting the ocean, land, ice sheets, and carbon sinks on land and at sea, it creates the conditions in which societies thrive or struggle. And by recognizing and acting on that knowledge, countries can minimize trade-offs and maximize benefits. Yeah, thank you very much as well from me. Um, absolutely, Karina, and, and according to UNEP, ecosystem-based adaptation has the potential to significantly enhance the resilience of society to climate change as a key part of those national and global adaptation efforts. But I think despite growing interest that we've seen that the current pace and scale of uh, ecosystem-based adaptation implementation is still falling quite a bit short of its potential. Indeed, John. Uh, our work with coastal cities highlights 
uh, well, many aspects, but three in particular, uh, social equity, scale, and finance, which unless they are carefully thought through, there are risks of local opposition, adverse socioeconomic and environmental effects. Ultimately, ecosystem-based adaptation, including nature-based solutions, could end up being practically unattainable and economically unsustainable in some places. So I, while I know that for many, it is intuitive to see nature-based as wholesome and better, and for the large parts, this can be true, it is absolutely critical to discuss how the benefits are distributed. Will the solutions benefit the same people who are covering the costs? Why is it being implemented here and not there? And can there be other areas or communities that could benefit more? Yeah, I think that's right. And it's important to recognize that even when you have approaches that have very good intentions, there can be some unexpected trade-offs that can, can thereby hinder any real transformational change. And so we have seen a, a bit of a proliferation of nature-based solution studies, uh, the, the programs and publications, but the focus has largely been on the science and the technology and the innovation that's required to generate the solutions. Um, I think there's also quite a lot of attention on the multiple benefits that could potentially be derived from nature-based solutions, but there's far less attention and focus at the moment on some of the socio-political and the human aspects, such as the power relations that are behind their design and their implementation um, and the potential impacts for different socio-economic groups. That's totally right. In fact, what we witness in our work is that we also need to consider that in many societies where nature-based solutions or ecosystem-based adaptation projects are proposed, there are a range of very urgent and unmet needs. And not all of these can be directly or limited or linked to nature or biodiversity. Many of the challenges are deeply entrenched in other issues, especially governance problems. So while it's important to recognize the connection of nature and climate for adaptation, as was already highlighted by our previous speakers, it's crucial to recognize there are no silver bullets, especially for those at the front line of both climate change and nature interventions. Instead, we need to make a stronger case for how these approaches can genuinely help diversify uh, livelihoods or improve the places where they are being implemented, rather than just assuming they will. Yeah, absolutely. And, and just last week or the week before, Karina, we were discussing the, uh, the elders who have produced um, they're, they're an independent group of global leaders who are working towards a sustainable and peaceful future. And they published a climate and nature policy paper that outlined a set of actions that governments and business and civil society um, could take that are aligned with global climate and nature goals. And I think there were, there were four um, particular points which resonate with some of the things that we've heard today. So one of those is the integration of climate action and protection of nature, which is uh, absolutely fundamental. And, you know, it's great to hear um, so much about how complementary both the, the actions are, but also some of the, some of the, the um, ongoing processes um, for the IPC and FS um, could potentially be. Uh, second is about revitalizing global cooperation and the, the absolute necessity of a multilateral response to the climate and nature crises. Third is around championing science, uh, science-based policymaking, um, particularly or especially now in this era of rising disinformation. And then, and then fourth, kind of very clearly coming through in this um, uh, webinar so far is around taking a joined up approach to policy making and recognizing the impact of climate change on all areas of human life. That's a really good summary, John. Thanks for that. I would I would like to add on to, to these overarching recommendations with some sort of practical reflections that I, I think need to go hand in hand uh, with these uh, recommendations. Uh, specifically more, I think we need practical steps for implementation. We hear this uh, being highlighted by our stakeholders and partners, essentially everywhere. In Sweden, for example, institutional lock-ins are hindering implementation. Take something like public procurement processes. They often steer things like constructions, and these constructions are often of more standard character and tend to favor reducing economic costs rather than prioritizing long-term benefits. But also issues like slow permit processes, spatial planning cycles, 
and finding ways to bring private landowners who own and control most of the land on board. In regions like the Caribbean or Southeast Asia, where we have uh, several projects uh, up and running on the issue, uh, we, we see the need for strategies that ensure low cost, long-term maintenance, and connect local efforts with global funding while diversifying livelihoods beyond the promise of ecotourism. And most importantly, I would say regardless of place, whether it's global north, global south, or however you want to divide the world, we need to flex the financial muscles of the private sector by making sure their priorities grasp the powerful connection between climate, nature, and vital ecosystems, aquatic, coastal, marine, and land alike. So they're driven to invest in transforming entire economic sectors. Yeah, that's right. And I think we've, we've heard it several times already, but I think it's worth saying again that finance is key. And some of our colleagues are working closely uh, on this issue from various approaches. But ultimately, if we're going to be able to transition to a more sustainable and more resilient economies, we're going to need to structure our finance and our financial systems to enable it. Otherwise, they could instead block that transition. And mainstream finance is going to have to be better aligned with the protection of nature and with human resilience. But there is an enabling role that climate finance and international development finance can play. And we can see that clearly in the science paper that also referenced earlier in the session, that a characteristic of successful cases is well-designed policy mixes, where, um, where a key aspect of that is the inclusion of tax and price incentives. And the financial connection is a fundamental one. We're now headed uh, quickly towards COP16 and COP29, where resource mobilization and climate finance for the transition are central questions around the table at these meetings. And even now, we still often frame nature as being separate from culture, uh, from society and from the economy. But as the uh, as Gupta review on the economics of biodiversity um, so clearly laid out uh, just a few years ago, back in 2021, nature, biodiversity and the climate are not external to our socioeconomic system. And in fact, they are entirely interconnected and interwoven. And it's going to have to be our systems, which currently don't recognise and value them adequately. It's going to have to be those ones which are going to need to change rather than climate and certainly not nature. That's a great way to wrap up, John. Thank you so much for this conversation. And a big thank you again to our keynote speakers for starting this discussion with such inspiring insights. So now that we've set the stage, I'm excited to dive into the speed talks and explore how we can mobilize finance for climate and nature. So over to you, Maya. Absolutely. Thank you, Karina. Thank you, Jonathan, for those brilliant additions and also referencing a lot of really interesting um, reports that the that viewers can dive into as well. We'll be moving on to the speed talk section now. And I just want to encourage everybody to put questions into the Q&A box as you're hearing from SEI experts talking about the different events in the series that will be exploring regional approaches um, to some of these challenges. And what I want to do first of all is hand over to my colleague at SEI Talent Center Director, Laurie Tamisti. Laurie, are you with us? The floor is yours. Hello, I'm here. However, I cannot stop my video. No worries. We will fix that for you, Laurie. One second. Okay. All good. Yes, thank you. Uh, we will uh, host in, in, in a month's time a seminar that will be a regional complementary view on, on the topics that we are launching today. And our focus will be mobilizing really finance for the climate biodiversity in the context of geopolitical tensions. Could we go to the next slide? And why uh, we chose that topic and what's the angle we want to cover? We want to take the global insights that were so nicely presented to us and then uh, link them with with the realities of the everyday research work and policy work that we are doing from SCI Italian office together with our colleagues in other offices. And what we see currently kind of going into another COP is really that 
commanding the political attention and mobilizing finance is really difficult. Even though, as we just heard, uh, there's so many science, there's so many evidence uh, really kind of demonstrating with, with clarity, with, uh, with authority and depth that actually we can do uh, the climate, uh, successful climate mitigation, the adaptation we can do, the biodiversity supportive policies that will be also economically beneficial and there's huge societal savings from us. Uh, however, on, on every political ground, we see that this message, this evidence needs to be reminded. It needs to be brought closer. It needs to be constant dialogue because losing sight of that understanding that green transition can bring also, if we talk about the geopolitical uh, challenges, if we talk about security, if we talk about war uh, and the impact, you know, renewable energy uh, can bring resilience, can reduce our dependence on imported fossil fuels. That's, that's a message that needs to be reminded. And in that context, what we really want to kind of tie together is really the tension uh, that currently Eastern Europe, Eastern Partnership region, Ukraine at, uh, first and foremost, but all other countries in that region as well. We are working currently from SCI side a major project supporting the green uh, transition in Georgia, Ukraine, Moldova, Armenia. And we see countries are so different each of the countries, not only in that region, but globally, they all have their stories. And we, as research institutions and partners for decision makers, we need to take that into account. So we want to bring together decision makers and discuss uh, really how, how to maintain uh, collaboration, because this is what we see, fragmentation and challenges to the cooperation. In tough times, countries want to you know, turn to autarky or a little bit become protectionist. This happens at the EU level. This happens at other, other regions, between regions. But in order to solve the climate issues, we need to uh, maintain collaboration. What we saw, for example, Ukraine is the uh, energy grid has only through the cooperation and hard work remain together with everyone contributing at, at the EU, at the Ukraine side, neighbors chipping in. Similarly, we see Moldova during the energy crisis was supported by Ukraine, Romania, EU. I think these are the examples where we can work together and get good results. And that's why going into the COP, we need to come together again uh, and jointly discuss how can we maintain the focus uh, and, and link the security, the well-being, quality of life, and not to lose out, uh, out of sight or, or kind of forget the climate and biodiversity lens. Uh, and and because this is what we see. Just this uh, week, we saw uh, there was a political statement that uh, Chancellor Scholz wants to open up the discussion on the EU deforestation regulation that was designed to protect the deforestation effects of EU import. These are all, all challenges that we see every day. And I think in terms of finance, uh, very rightly, previous keynote speaker said that there's enough capital in the world, but in order the capital to be mobilized, few things need to happen. Governments need to put in place very good supportive uh, regulatory framework to create the incentives capital, uh, international donors, finances, private sector uh, finance, they need to create a very solid framework in order that investments to flow. This is what we're seeing in all of those East, Eastern partnership countries that the supportive financial capacity is not there. And thirdly, you need to invest into capacities uh, and the skills of the people. You might have the best regulation, you might have access to finance, but if you don't have the skills of the people to implement these green transition investments, you will not get the results. So this is what we are seeing currently based on our work in the region. And this is what we want to tie together in our event uh, in October. Thank you. Thank you very much, Harry. 
And with that, I would like to hand over to my colleague, Philip Asano, Centre Director for SCI Africa, who will be talking through bioeconomy for climate resilient development. Over to you, Philip. Thank you, uh, Brian. Thank you, colleagues. Um, our focus actually in terms of this coming event for the Africa is going to be on bioeconomy for climate uh, resilient development. The next slide, please. Uh, just to highlight the fact that uh, when it comes to Africa, uh, biodiversity loss, which of course has been mentioned by uh, Dr. Bora, the EPS chair, is, is, is uh, accelerating uh, and is also fundamental because uh, Africa is one of those places where uh, we uh, fall in the tropics. And we know that, you know, two thirds of the world biodiversity are found uh, within the tropical region. So any uh, challenges that we have with biodiversity loss, of course, uh, affect Africa, but most importantly, uh, just to understate and underscore that uh, Africa biodiversity is a very important, uh, plays a very important role uh, for national economies, uh, but also even for uh, livelihoods. Many, many people, especially in the rural areas, um, actually depend on biodiversity directly for food security, but also indirectly uh, for other measures. I wanted to highlight uh, one thing which is important for uh, Africa um, and why we're focusing on biodiversity is the fact that uh, when you look at the continent and when you look at the population, it's actually estimated uh, by the UN population uh, division that more than three quarters of the increase uh, of population from today's current 7.7 uh, .7 billion people will actually uh, happen in sub-Saharan Africa. That means that we are looking at uh, a massive increase in, in human population uh, from about 1.1 billion uh, from 2019 estimates to about 3.8 billion by 2100. So when you look at those climate models and the impact of climate change in the region, we know the region is actually the fastest warming region um, in the world. We know that that would have massive consequences. But uh, another issue is that what would the demographic shift, uh, how would that affect uh, the, the Africa uh, region? Next slide. Just to say that currently, um, Africa comprises just about 14% uh, of the world's uh, total population, but represents 13% of the world economy. Uh, a large part of African population is actually young people. Um, and, and many of you must have seen what's been happening, that a key challenge that many governments are facing in Africa is, of course, how to create employment. So we see, of course, within Africa that by economy presents uh, a potential um, opportunity, actually, for low carbon emission development uh, pathway, not just for national development, but also in terms of looking at investment in areas like energy, uh, in areas like um, dealing with issues such as, uh, you know, uh, alternative to plastics to address public pollution, and also to actually contribute towards uh, nature, nature conservation, which is quite important. SCI has been working quite significantly on the issue of bioeconomy together with the International Center for Insect Physiology and Ecology, which is based here in Nairobi, and the East Africa community through the East Africa Science and Technology Commission. We have actually undertaken studies to look at different bio-based sectors uh, in Africa, in East Africa, that can actually contribute to our strengthening economies. And we published a state of bioeconomy report in uh, 2022, the first report of its kind uh, for the region. That actually then informed uh, policy measures within the East Africa community uh, which then adopted uh, East Africa Regional Bioeconomy bio Strategy. This is actually the, the second bioeconomy strategy in the world after, after the EU uh, bioeconomy strategy. Next slide. And so to continue to sort of like expand on this work, we see really four areas that are very critical when it comes to opportunities for bioeconomy. Uh, one is, of course, looking at food security um, and sustainable agriculture. We know that most African economy agriculture plays a significant role in terms of uh, food security, and we see by economy uh, pro presenting potential pathways really for uh, low carbon emission development. For example, currently we are looking at opportunities for bio-based fertilizer because we know that application of fertilizer in, in other parts of the world has really contributed to massive uh, eutrophication and pollution. Uh, we are looking also at um, bio-based uh, insecticides and pesticides by pesticides, you know, to help address the issues of the use of chemical uh, pesticides that also affects the environment. Uh, second area which is focused for us is actually to look at human health and well-being. 
a lot of people in Africa, especially in the rural areas, actually depend on uh, nature and natural products for medicinal purposes, but also for health and well-being. A third area is actually also looking at bio-based industrial development. Of course, for example, many African countries uh, depend on forestry sector. Uh, contributes massively, of course, to, for example, construction industry and so on. And we're looking at how this could actually be expanded. And the last area is actually sustainable energy. And so just uh, to recap our event now, uh, which is scheduled for the 3rd of October, will actually be a signature event towards highlighting uh, the Global Bioeconomy Summit uh, on 2024, which we'll be hosting here in Nairobi from the 23rd and 24th of October. So we actually really uh, look forward to what sort of like highlighting these opportunities and opportunities that my economy brings, mostly of course to Africa, but we believe of course there's a lot of learning and uh, cross-sharing for lessons across uh, particularly the developing uh, regions of the world, uh, including Latin America and, 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 and Asia, Southeast Asia. I think that's the end uh, from, from my side, Maya. Thank you very much, Philip. That was fantastic. And now I am going to hand over to our colleague, Monica Triello, who is at SEI Latin America Research Fellow and is going to talk in more detail about synergizing biodiversity con conservation, also in the run up to CBD COP16. Monica, please take the Thank floor. Thank you very much, Maya. And um, will a uh, our webinar is called Synergizing Biodiversity Conservation, Climate Action, and Sustainable Development Insights for COP16. Um, and this webinar will be held on October the 1st at 9 a.m. Colombian time. And it will focus on the Amazon region. So please, could you please change the, the slide? is the world's largest tropical forest and water system located in nine countries in South America, as you can see in the slide. It is a vital terrestrial carbon sink, an extraordinary biodiversity hotspot. It represents 10% of known Earth's biodiversity. However, this tropical forest is experiencing deforestation and intense ecological degradation. More than 85 million hectares of forests have been lost. 17% of the ecosystem is degraded. As, and as Maya was presenting, there are severe droughts and fires at present. There are multiple interconnected causes for this problem. We are focusing on two key drivers, institutional and economic aspects. These include policy incoherence, conflicting regulation and implementation failures, among others. Additionally, the prevailing economic model prioritizes short-term gains from unsustainable activities. So in this region, natural forest conservation is the most effective climate change adaptation and mitigation strategy. So the conservation and sustainable use of the Amazon tropical forest are fundamental to ensuring climate action. Colombia and Brazil will host the next COP, COPs on biodiversity and climate change next year. The purpose of COP16 on biodiversity is to integrate the agenda of biodiversity conservation and climate action, and to transform the production model towards sustainability. Could you please change the slide? So the objective of the webinar is to discuss critical elements for integrating the climate and biodiversity agendas in the framework of COP16, emphasizing the transitions needed for the Amazon economic model. So we will emphasize some key messages. The first one is that policy coherence must be prioritized for integrating biodiversity conservation and climate action to advance sustainable transitions in the Amazon region. We will discuss comprehensive strategies for this integration, such as ecological restoration, agroforestry, value chains management of biodiversity, or for example, non-timber forest products, among other practices, 
within the bioeconomy as the model that can facilitate these sustainability transitions. We also will discuss SEI deep expertise in providing actionable research and insights for the intersection of environmental governance, sustainable development and policy coherence. And finally, we're going to highlight the tools and recommendations developed through our research to equip stakeholders with practical implementation strategies to promote these synergies between the goals of Biodiversity COP16 in Colombia and Climate Change COP30 in Brazil. So thank you very much. That's the end. Thank you, Monica. And just for everybody, I've put into the chat the link. If you would like to find out more about these webinars, you can find them through here. There are various different tabs. So when you come to that web page, do scroll down a bit and you can find details about every SEI Center's um, specific events. And with that, moving on, um, I would like to call our colleague Francis X. Johnson to the floor, who is going to be presenting from SEI Asia, moving from forestry to, um, to also uh, nature-based solutions. Francis, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot, Maya. Um, yes, uh, and actually we will pick up here some of the themes already mentioned by, by my colleagues, Monica and Philip in, in Africa and Latin America, particularly the sustainable use of biodiversity. But uh, let me go into some details about the region. If we can take the next slide, please. <clears throat> and uh, you can take the next few bullets. Yeah, that's good, thanks. Um, so um, those not so familiar with Southeast Asia, this uh, is a, a very sensitive region in many ways. It's, it's home to some of the world's richest biodiversity. Uh, and because of the long coastlines and uh, the, the investments in, in agriculture and forestry and fishing, these might be significantly impacted by, by climate change. And in fact, it's one of the, the more vulnerable regions of the world uh, in terms of exposure to climate change. Um, the coastal areas are critical for local livelihoods. The, uh, there are also a number of disbenefits uh, which are related to, to the agriculture sector, deforestation. And so we have a, a rather serious poly crisis in the form of uh, land, climate, and, and biodiversity. But some good news is that um, the region is, is starting to engage in, in more partnerships and cooperation, which is something we are trying to support. There is a lot of complementarity. And in particular, we're going to focus on nature-based solutions and sustainable use of, of biodiversity. Can take the next slide. So uh, just to mention that um, uh, something about the region in terms of the significant impacts of, of land use change. Um, if you look at the, the region of Southeast Asia and compare it to other regions of the world, the share of, of emissions associated with land use change is actually the highest of, of any region. And this is not only a, a problem for emissions, it's also a major source of land degradation and biodiversity loss. So here you have all in one, the three Rio conventions. Um, we mentioned here also the third one that hasn't been talked about so much earlier, which is the UNCCD. And although desertification is not an issue in, in Southeast Asia the, as much uh, as it would be in, in Africa, of course, but uh, land degradation is a very serious issue. Um, and so, so we have this sort of triple crisis. We can take the next. <clears throat> so what are the possibilities for, for nature-based solutions and uh, thinking on the, on the carbon removal side? What are the opportunities there? Uh, we've been doing some, some research uh, in an EU-sponsored uh, project on the potential for different land-based options. And uh, you can see if you look at the bar graph on the left that there is a quite high potential, that's uh, gigatons potential, uh, according to this uh, analysis and review. And the dominance, uh, as, as in many regions, is on afforestation. But the issue is, of course, that uh, we cannot rely on uh, afforestation alone. There has been perhaps too much emphasis on this. There has to be a portfolio of options. And um, it's also uh, each, each year, or every two years, the UN regional office puts out this, this analysis on the right that shows, for example, how nature-based solutions can 
contribute to fulfilling the, the goals, the NDCs in, in the region. We can take the next slide. <clears throat> so uh, another part of the research we've been doing uh, with uh, uh, some partners in this project is looking at from both uh, the modeling and analysis, but also from stakeholders' perspectives. And what we're seeing is that climate ambition can synergize with biodiversity conservation targets. So these scenarios show Southeast Asia going out to 2095 and how it might look in the case of very high climate ambition. And it turns out, it seems to be the case that there is a, a quite good correlation with improved biodiversity as well, because you can see that the cropland if you look at the brown areas, you see that cropland is decreasing significantly and natural areas are increasing significantly. Of course, this is also going to imply a significant amount of land use change, but it's land use change that would be positive for climate and biodiversity. You can take the next slide. Um, there's a particular role for, for wetlands, uh, which, which includes peatlands and, and mangroves as rather important cases of wetlands. And so in our seminar, uh, our webinar on the 3rd of October, there will be some special emphasis on, on wetlands. And they really are crucial for biodiversity and carbon management in the region. 60% of the world's tropical peatlands are found, 42% of mangrove forest, and just an enormous amount of, of wetlands, many that are ramps are protected. So really this idea that wetlands are the nature superheroes is, a, is an interesting story, which we'll try to tell uh, in a few weeks when we meet. Okay, I think that's it. Wonderful, <clears throat> excuse me. Thank you so much, Francis. And our final speed talk today is our colleague, Ed Carr, Center Director of SCI US, who will be talking about From Gray to Green, Finding Common Cause for People and Planet. Ed, please explain what is the gray? We, I think we all know what the, the, green, the green is. Over to you. Thank you very much, and thanks to everyone who's attending today, and hopefully we'll see you at this session. Uh, yeah, the starting point here is that title, Gray to Green. Uh, gray to Green might be something that triggers thinking about different kinds of infrastructure for people, but in our event, we're going to be talking about gray as in the gray areas that we have to work in when trying to bring together climate and biodiversity work. This is a theme that I think you've heard at least in the undertones of every talk today, that working on this does put us into situations where we have to think through deeply challenging but necessary compromises um, among researchers, policymakers, the wider communities we serve, um, but also to think about how to collaborate across different institutional settings and different contexts. Both of these are challenging. Both of these are really, really necessary for the work that we do. Uh, can we have the next slide, please? Uh, a key point here is that SEI, as an organization, dives into these spaces. We, this is where we work. We have quite a bit of learning in this space. And that, I think, makes our work not only more realistic and effective, but provides an opportunity to convey learning about how to do this sort of work to a much wider community. There really is no way to do this work without involving some kind of trade-off, whether that's between outcomes, between constituencies, or both. And these are some of the most important barriers, these trade-offs, uh, to uh, addressing the pressing environmental challenges that we worry about in the world today. So with that deep experience, that's what we hope to bring to the table in our session. So for example, our researchers have built communities of practice around sophisticated SEI tools, uh, such as our energy modeling with LEAP, uh, which paint a picture of how governments can manage natural resources more efficiently and equitably, creating opportunities for collaboration uh, between civil society and government actors to drive change toward more sustainable futures. At the same time, we work to fill research gaps while creating opportunities for low-income communities to meet their basic needs for fuel uh, while preserving forests and habitats. All of this is critical, not just for the knowledge base, but also for thinking about implementation. We've been working with organizations, implementing on the ground solutions for quite some time, and we work with them to identify opportunities to address these trade-offs in a manner that maximizes not only environmental outcomes, but also the equitable experience of their benefits. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? 
So what you see here are the topics that we'll be covering. So using examples from everywhere, from California, Silicon Valley, to Quito, Peru, uh, to low and middle income countries dependent on wood fuel, and even perhaps really, really relevant to what we saw today at the kickoff of this event, uh, the creation of global environmental assessments. Uh, we'll have different experts uh, talking about the gray areas that emerge uh, across all of this work, highlighting the tensions between human and biodiversity demands and how we can turn tension into cooperation. The goal here is to show you different ways in which these gray areas emerge and how we have navigated those to get to green outcomes. And with that, I look forward to seeing you at our event and over back to you, Maya. Thank you very much, Ed, and thank you to all of our speakers today. I'm going to ask my colleagues, Alessia, could you please put all of the SEI speakers up on screen? We have got about eight minutes whereby we can do a little bit of verbal Q&A, and it would be fantastic if they could all be spotlighted, please. Francis, Philip, uh, Monica, Karina, and we have also back fantastic. Could you please put your videos on? Excellent. And I am going to, I've picked out a few questions. Um, I'm actually going to open this to the floor. So please put up your hand if you would like to, if you would like to answer. Um, one of the first queries is, are there any good examples of policy initiatives at the national level that can ensure joint efforts for climate and biodiversities? For example, linked strategies or government bodies who work with the issues side by side in a coherent and integrated manner. So it'd be great to hear from, from all of our speakers, have you come across these types of examples in practice? And can we talk to, yeah, how, how they look? Hands up, it's free for all. Awesome, please. Um, I, I can't think of so many, I will have to say. I know, for example, here in Sweden, the, the country uh, I know best, um, there is now a joint inquiry into how can Sweden simultaneously meet the EU nature restoration uh, targets and legislation uh, and also the uh, uh, carbon dioxide uh, uptake um, targets in the Lulu CF uh, regulation from the EU. So, so it's sort of looking at the, the uh, climate uh, target and the biodiversity target together, but we don't know yet what, what sort of policy proposals they will um, uh, end up with. But no, I think, I think you're pointing at the, you know, there, there is a, uh, often a, a disconnect and while it's good that we see more and more climate specific institutions, um, in, in many countries uh, that it's also telling that they have this, you know, single uh, objective. Yeah, absolutely. And hopefully in coming years, we will see more if more of us keep on helping to share this knowledge and this insight from both IPCC and um, IPES and, and the broader scientific community. Laurie, please. Yes, I will also bring an example from Estonia, the country that uh, our center is uh, situated in. And and uh, two years ago, uh, I had the honor to chair a, a government uh, expert group that was advising the government on how to do a successful green transition. And back then, it was also the government was asking, "What is the green transition? We understand the climate and energy part, but what is what is the rest? And you know how to approach it." And what we then, with a, a group of experts from scientific community and the business community, we put together, we also said, recommended, and saw that, yes, there is a lot to build upon. And th that goes for, I think, globally. Any country you go, there's, there's a lot of already building existing capacities uh, in terms of thinking about, you know, uh, emission reduction and climate policies and energy policies. Now it's, you need to add that, you know, green part uh, next to it. And that is what we recommended that, hey, you need to develop a holistic first plan and then set of tools to track the plan. Uh, and I, I'm really happy to see that the government one year later adopted uh, then at the government level, 
the holistic green transition plan. And it was the first time encompassing all uh, different parts and policies. And also what the, uh, the government then announced is that, okay, we are start building to fill the gaps, meaning developing tracking tools. Minister of Finance wants to link now the budget policy to this green transition goals, develop a metrics, we also, as an institute, we are supporting now ministry who is responsible for planning. We are developing quantitative tools for urban planners that if municipal level, they want to develop and ask, is my plan kind of climate proof in terms of mitigation, adaptation, you know, quality of life point of view and, and greenness and point of view. How would you need to go about it? What kind of metrics do you need to take account? So we are developing step by step these tools. But yeah. what we've also seen as an uh, as a research organization is that that part is harder. You know, it's easy to do carbon tunnel vision because mm -hmm. it's fairly straightforward. But adding that these layers becomes uh, more and more complex, but it's doable. You know, mm -hmm. because I mean, if you take the progress that we have done in terms of tracking and thinking about, you know, what's the progress in, in our climate pledges or NDCs or national energy climate plans. It's all coming along. So yeah. so I'm pretty sure that, you know, with the collaboration, we will we, we will also create these frameworks. Yeah. It's coming along. It's coming. Thank you. That reminds me of a, um, a podcast. This was in, in Swedish, uh, Swedish Ekot, this week with um, looking at you know the trap the state of the transformation and there was a quote from um swedish scientist karl folke who said that he feels we are in the midst of a new renaissance we are in the middle of this transformation phase where there's a lot of evidence on the table we haven't quite got there yet but we're in that messy space where hopefully you know very very soon a lot of these things will start to be implemented. I'd like to pick up um, a question and I'll actually give this to, to Monica and to Francis. I have um, a question from Yamino Yogya and she says, in the transition to more climate resilient and biodiversity focused livelihoods, such as those within the bioeconomy or sustainable farming, and Philip, please do, do also answer this, what incentives can be provided to stakeholders like farmers to support and facilitate this shift? Maybe if we could start with Philip, then Monica and Francis. So I think, uh, uh, talking about incentives, I think I would speak to three things uh, when it comes to farmers. Um, one is, uh, for example, I'll give an example of Africa. When you look at Africa, uh, Many countries have national uh, fertilizer subsidy programs. When you look at these subsidy programs, they currently do not integrate uh, biofertilizers. Um, so one incentive would be uh, to make available within the national subsidy programs biofertilizers as one of the main options that farmers can then choose from. Because currently don't, they don't have a choice; they have to uh, be given mostly um, commercial fertilizers uh, that is already. Um, um, does not provide them with that option to actually uh, get, uh, uh, you know, biofertilizers. Number two is the fact that when we look at, uh, again, uh, you know, the public policy investments, um, a good example is uh, even soil testing. We see a lot of investment in mechanization, which is good because it's visible and it's politically good and convenient. Uh, for politicians to actually take credit because they have something tangible. But we don't see investment, for example, in soil testing. When you look at some of the work that we've done in Africa on economics of land degradation, we see that large areas of farming uh, land in Africa is actually uh, massively um, has lost soil fertility. But the farmers themselves don't know uh, because they don't have the tools and the right tools to be able to, to test their soils. So that's important that, you know, making available labs and laboratories yeah at cheaper cost would help farmers be able to, um, uh, to do soil testing. And lastly, of course, just expanding the extension programs uh, just to make awareness about uh, alternatives that farmers might have in terms of sustainable farming practices. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Philip. We are at time, but I, I would love to invite anyone who can stay for just one or two more minutes. And so we can hear from Monica, Francis and Ed. Go. <laughs> Thank you, Maya. Yes, it's a... Uh... A very good question, and I think that the most powerful incentive could be 
connecting to market. Market, I think the market incentives are the most powerful to move changes, to, to, to give solutions to people that need livelihoods, that need employment, that need income. So connecting this technical transformation with market, with, with very good connected value change could be a very good incentive for change. Fantastic. Thank you. Francis. Yeah, it's an excellent question because um, farmers have this, this burden of feeding the world. And uh, in unlike the global north, in the global south, there are a lot of small farmers who, you know, uh, really struggle. So giving them, as Monica says, giving them access actually to downstream markets and innovation um, in the use of bio-based materials for, for various products, for construction, um, and, and these type of areas. Uh, because there has to be a balance between conservation of biodiversity and sustainable use of biodiversity. And um, we have actually done a little bit of field work on this. Um, in Thailand in particular uh, is the biodiversity-based economic development organization. And they particularly uh, emphasize this, how to bring these opportunities into, into rural areas. And this needs, to, although we don't like to talk about scaling up everything, this does need to be done at, at a bigger scale because it's, it's rather niche, these type of things. So yes, in general, I, I follow the line that, that Monica has taken. Fantastic, thank you, Francis. And Ed, if I could ask you in under one minute, that would be brilliant, thanks. Yeah, I can do under one minute. Uh, I will not do 25 years of research on this exact topic on, on all of you right now, uh, except to say that it's a great question. And the, what I would add to my colleagues on this is simply that incentivization is context specific. And one of the things that we need a lot more work on is a deep understanding of the social context of the people we're working with. Uh, too often, I think we impose very broad solutions on people that are designed in other places. And when we bring them to context, we don't understand why people don't take them up. When in fact, if we'd spent some time really engaging with those people, we would have designed the incentive different, I mean, the whole project differently or the intervention quite differently. So I think of this as a plea for a deeper understanding of the people we're working with. And that's, I think, something that we're pretty good at here. Fantastic. Thank you. Jonathan, I would like to give you the closing word of anything that you would like to add after reflecting on all of the conversations today, and then we will wrap up. Uh, thank you very much. And I, I wasn't expecting that, so I've not got anything uh, very grand to say, but except that it's been really heartening actually to hear um, all of the joined up thinking that's going on both within SEI and also uh, in these, these huge uh, kind of global endeavors that are the IFS and IPCC. So, uh, I've certainly come away from this uh, heartened that we are at least moving in the right direction and getting there. Uh, maybe not fast enough, but we are we are speeding up. So. Agreed, which is why we need everyone on this call doing as much as they can with this knowledge as well. With that, I am going to say a warm thanks to everyone who's attended and everybody who has contributed speeches and support and creation for getting this series going. We have put the link in the chat for where you can find out about more of the events and sign up. So with that, thank you very much, everybody. And we hope to see you at another event very soon. Thanks. Goodbye.